Kelly for introducing me. So, um, I am from uh, the University of Michigan, but as has been noted, I was at HP, and actually all of the work that I'm talking about, is it not on? Um, so all of the work that I'll be talking about was actually done while H at HP Labs in California. So first I'll talk about how one might search social networks using data gathered from online communities. Next, I'll talk about how information flows in networks. And finally, if there's time, I'll describe a little study we did of political blogs and what their linking behavior was during the 2004 election. The reason why we can do a lot of this interesting social networks research now and that it was difficult before is because now people are leaving, leading their lives digitally. In a way, we communicate with others through email, through instant messaging, um, phones, we might write a blog, um, and also register with one of the online social networking sites. So what used to take social scientists a long time to do because they had to do face-to-face -face interviews, now we can gather automatically almost as a side effect of people leading these digital lives. So first I'll talk about um, insights into how people search their social networks. If you want to get from one part of the network to another, how you can use your social ties to reach a person you would like to reach. Probably most of you are familiar with the famous small world experiment from the 1960s. Stanley Milgram recruited some participants from Nebraska and instructed them to mail an envelope to a uh, target in Boston, Massachusetts. However, they couldn't just mail it directly. They needed to pass it on first to someone that they knew on a first name basis. And that person would then pass on the message further. At the time, when people were asked how many hops they thought it would take, they would say hundreds. Turned out not to be the case at all. For the messages that came through, they took an average only six, um, six hops, hence the term six degrees of separation. The experiment was recently repeated at Columbia using email. So rather than mailing an envelope, you would just email someone you knew. In this experiment, they expanded it to 18 countries over different, con or actually 13 countries in different continents. And for the messages that got through, the number of hops was just four. So it really is a very small world. Now, granted, only about 1% or less of the messages got through, and this is because people kind of ignore spam in their inboxes. So why is this interesting to study? Well, first we'd like to know why is the world small? Why are social networks structured this way? And even more interestingly, how are people able to route messages? How do they know exactly what, uh, which of their acquaintances to pass the message to? And also recently, social networking has kind of bloomed as a business. So they're kind of the more personal websites like Friendster, Orkut, MySpace, and Facebook. And also ones designed more for the business professional like LinkedIn, Spoke, Invisible Path. And all of them are trying to solve kind of this problem, how to make introductions through uh, a social network. So first, why is the world small? If you think about it, if I know a few hundred people, say on the order of a thousand, and each of them knows a thousand people in turn. Well, that's like a million people right there. And by the time I've gone to my friends of friends of friends, it should be the population of the whole US. But you'd say, wait a minute. A lot of my friends' friends are my friends. So you might not have this great expansion. However, what Watson Strogatz showed in 1998 is that you can have clustering. So uh, my friends are, or my friends' friends are also my friends. But as long as you have a few random links, so that person you met while you were traveling or someone who had moved away, the average shortest path is still very short. And so you get this small world phenomenon. Okay, so now for the more interesting thing, um, how are people able to find these paths? If they really do know a thousand different people, how do they know which one is the right one? And over the decades, as people have been studying this problem, they would ask people, so what's your strategy? 
And overwhelmingly, they would say it's one of three simple things. Either they choose someone who is geographically closer to the person they're trying to reach, so they live closer. Um, if, so if you're trying to reach someone in Boston, if you know someone who's somewhere else in Massachusetts, you pass it to that person. Or they might um, use the person's profession. So if the person is a stockbroker and you know someone who's a banker, you would pass it to the banker. And finally, if they felt really stuck, like they didn't know how to get closer to the person, they might just choose someone who is they perceive to be well-connected. And so they're more likely to know someone who would be closer to the target. And recently, several models have been proposed to explain why or how social networks could be structured to allow such very simple strategies to work. So Kleinberg proposed a model of um, spatial search first, where he said, if everyone's on a lattice, a 2D lattice, and everyone is connected to their four closest neighbors, and they're also connected to other people at random, but with a probability that decreases as one over d squared d being the distance between the two people. So this means you're much more likely to know someone who lives on the same block as you than someone who lives in the same city, than someone who lives in the same state, etc. So let's see um, how this works. So first imagine that, okay, you are connected to your four closest neighbors, but all your other connections are completely random. And you're going to use this greedy search strategy, which means at each point in the chain, the person who has the message passes it to someone they know who's closest to the target. Well, in this case, you do well at first, right? You find these shortcuts, but as you're getting closer to the target, you have no useful shortcuts. You might be in the same city, but um, the links that those people have are still fairly random, so you can't use them. On the other extreme, imagine that you're limited in the, in the range of, I guess, uh, of people you know, right? So you only know people who are really close by. In that case, you have links that are kind of local and lead you in the right direction, but they're just too short, and you end up taking a long time. Now, if you have this one over distance squared relationship, it's a nice balance, right? Because you can have both these long shortcuts, and once you're close by, you also have the shorter range um, links. Okay, but people didn't just say they used geography to find the, the target. They also used things like profession. So um, Kleinberg, as well as Watts, Dodds, and Newman, proposed a model where a uh, Geography is just a subset, but you can imagine people um, associating within a hierarchy. So one thing is, you know, neighborhood, city, state, but also you could have a group, a research group at a department, the whole department, the university, um, all the universities in the same country. And you're uh, much more likely to know someone who is closer to you in the hierarchy, say here or here, than someone all the way over here. And this would also allow you to use a simple strategy. And finally, there's just kind of the, well, I don't know who might know this person. So um, here's Jane. She's just watched Pretty Woman. And she says, oh, I'd really like to meet Richard Gere. Who could introduce me? So she could um, you know, flood her request to all her friends Right? But that's kind of wasteful every time she wants to know someone. So she'd just like to ask one person, kind of like in the Milgram experiment. So she could ask her friend Mary, but Mary's kind of shy, doesn't know too many people. Or she could ask Bob, and Bob is really outgoing, knows all these people, and so is more likely to know Richard Gere. Even if he doesn't, he's more likely to know someone who does. So this is the high degree search. and. Um, a situation where high degree search works is naturally one where there is a great imbalance in the number of links. And these are the kinds of networks that we see, um, they're, they're power law networks, and we see them over and over again on the web. Say the web is a power law network, the internet is a power law network, peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing networks are power law as well. So uh, in these kinds of networks, you have these extremely well-connected hubs 
but there are a lot of nodes that just have one connection. So if we just choose one node at random, happens to have degree one, which is common in this network, and now we'll go from node to node, and each node can tell us about its neighbors. It can tell whether one of its friends is someone that we're looking for. So we always choose the best connected neighbor, and already at step two, we found the best connected node, and in just four steps, we've reached about you know, three-fourths of, of this network. And this definitely would not work in a traditional random graph where the links are really randomly dispersed. So any two nodes have equal probability of being linked. And even though not all nodes have the same number of links, the distribution is um, pretty narrow. So here we choose a node at random. And we're trying to do the same thing. We're trying to find the hubs, the well-connected nodes. And it's just not working as well, right? We take the same number of steps and maybe we've covered 20% of the network. So um, a study that we did was to look at a real world network, the HP Labs email network, and to see can we apply these dumb search strategies and in fact find these short paths. Because what people had done up to now was they would run these experiments and they would get the chains for the ones that completed, but they had no view of the whole network. Um, so if we uh, look at the email logs of HP Labs and include all the senders, so external people mailing in, people within labs mailing other people within labs and, and externally, and of course there, there's some spammers in here as well, and we plot the degree distribution. This is how many people you've emailed. Um, on a log-log scale, what we observe is that a lot of these, a, a good fraction of the senders just sent to one or two recipients, and then there are other senders who have emailed thousands of people. So this is very well suited to the high-degree search because HP Labs is under 1,000 people. So if you get to someone who's emailing 1,000 people, um, there's a good chance you'll reach a good fraction of the network. However, if we think about what we're trying to do, which is, you know, typically when you use a social network to do something, um, you're asking for a favor. You're saying, can someone, you know, help me find a job? Or I would like to collaborate with someone. Can you introduce me to so-and-so so that we can work together? So simply someone spamming everybody won't have that effect. This needs to go through meaningful ties. And the way that we simulated this then in the HP Labs email network is we only allowed links that were between people who had emailed each other a certain number of times back and forth during a given time period. And here you can see that then the, the highest degree is around 60. So sure, you can easily just hit send and email hundreds of people, but if you have to carry on conversations with them, you can only typically fit in so many. And here, when we simulate the search, it actually takes 40 steps on average and a median of 16 to reach a randomly chosen target. So it's actually quite slow to just kind of say, I'm going to go through the best connected person I know. So the next strategy we tried out was geography. This is what the inside of HP Labs looks like. So it's a cubicle farm like many others. And it's on a grid. and um, each cubicle has a nearest post, and that's how its location is marked. And then if we look at the email communication overlaid on the geography, so these are the different floors of the different buildings, and um, let's see, the color coding is that email between people who sit close by is blue and red if they're far apart, and you can see that predominantly people who sit close together are actually the ones who are emailing each other. But if we look at the relationship between the distance, how far apart people's cubicles are, and their probability of emailing, it's actually one over the distance, not one over the distance squared, which would have been optimal. So this means that there are people who might sit quite close together might not be emailing, and people who are far apart might be emailing more than what would be optimal for search, but might be optimal for other things. Um, the other search strategy we tried was using the organizational hierarchy. 
So I'm somewhere, or was somewhere down here, um, down at the bottom. And this is Dick Lantlin, the head of HP Labs. And if we overlay the email communication, at first it looks like a big jumble, right? But you can actually see that it clings quite closely to the organizational hierarchy. So this is good. It means that people who are supposed to be working together, who are in the same groups, are talking to each other. But at the same time, you have this uh, cross-collaboration and cross-communication, which is also good. And so what you'd like to do is, when you're trying to start collaborating with someone, rather than having to ask your manager who asks their manager who asks the Clampman who asks so-and-so to get to that person, you just like to use the existing social network. So maybe your manager actually knows this person here um, who can you know, tell this guy that, hey, let's, let's work together. And if we look at the probability that two people are emailing each other versus their distance in the hierarchy, it's an exponential relationship, which is the one that was found to be good for using these kinds of search strategies. And if we look at the results, so if you were just searching at random, right, it would take you a median number of 28 steps. If you were strictly following the organizational hierarchy, it would take six steps. But if you're using the organizational hierarchy as your guide, but using the informal email network, then you can get there in a median of four steps, which is actually quite good. It's only one step more than the actual shortest path. So you pay a penalty for not being omniscient, for not publishing, okay, this is exactly who's emailing whom, and you can still uh, kind of get through the network. Um, and using geography, it's seven steps, which is a bit long, and it also kind of corresponds to that observation earlier that people aren't placed optimally for this kind of search, but again, it's kind of expensive to move desks around, and um, you know, it works for other things, and people can use the org chart to direct their search. So just uh, to wrap this section up, what we found was that individuals were organized into groups, and this greatly facilitated search. Uh, one thing that we also found as in the course of this was that some individuals were very easy to find. Typically, they were high up in the organization, and they tend to talk to a lot of people and were also central in the network. And then it still left some questions as to whether people, when they search in the real world, are using some more sophisticated strategies, um, not just geography and profession, or if they're actually looking a few steps ahead. So. Um, you know, I know that that person doesn't know who I'm looking for directly, but I know that they know someone who does, or something of that sort. So next I'll talk about not actively searching a network, but just simply observing how information flows, and also trying to figure out um, what exactly the flow is, and how it can be used to um, rank information sources. And for this, we were studying blogs. And the reason why blogs are good to study is because, well, first of all, I'm assuming that everyone knows what blogs are. Yeah? Oh, all right. Well, I'll just continue on then. Um, so they're, they have nicely timestamped entries. So you know when exactly, or within a day, since you often don't know the time zone, um, when someone has started talking about something in particular. And sometimes it's very in particular because they'll provide a link, a URL, which is usually unique. They might even tell you, um, I saw this, in this case, giant microbes, which were these cute um, stuffed animals that were supposed to represent things like the common cold. Um, and they might even say, okay, I, I saw this on another blog. And even if they don't, they'll frequently have blog roles which tell us which other blogs they frequently read. So we might infer where they got this information. Another thing that we might be interested in is not just exactly how the information flows, but what the pattern of popularity for certain items is over time. Um, and what I mean by that if, is we'd like to know whether some kinds of information tend to peak very rapidly. So this might be something that was um, posted on Slashdot, right? Becomes immensely popular 
while it's on the main slash dot page, and then once it rolls off, relatively speaking, it gets much less attention. And there's something we call the boing boing effect, where you know there might be something, in, and some blogs are finding it interesting. It might get posted to boing boing, then really get a surge of interest, and then kind of go away more gracefully. And there are various services such as Blogdex, Blog Pulse, Technorati that track all of these trends. Um, and the, so one of the reasons why it's interesting to look for different patterns is because they kind of tell you how the information is being transmitted. So there are two things here. In the blue, we have this Wired article about Orrin Hatch, who is a senator from Utah. And it was this article saying, you know, is he a software pirate? Because what had happened was that Orrin Hatch was very adamant about software piracy being wrong. And anyone found with unlicensed software in their computer should have their computer destroyed. And then, ironically, it was found that his very own official website was using unlicensed software. And so this kind of found um, you know, some resonance in the blog community, and they talked about it. But you can see that the day the article came out is when it gets the most mentions and then kind of dies off. Another example are these election map cartograms, which were made at the University of Michigan, actually. So for days after the election, mostly what you saw was this, you know, on USA Today and Time and all that. Well, what um, the research team there did was they first, um, you know, gave it intermediate coloring, so it's not just red or blue. And also they... Ex they distorted the map so that the population density everywhere is equal, right? So that means that the East Coast and, and California are kind of expanding out. And people found this very interesting and kind of refreshing to look at, but it never appeared on a mainstream media source. So you can see people kind of catching on and discussing it and so on, and then it's still getting some interest even 20 days later. And in the end, it actually gets more mentions from blogs than the Wired article. Um, so we looked at a period of a month, and we got um, URLs that were mentioned more than 40 times out of a set of about 100,000 blogs. And we could very easily cluster them into four groups. There was the slash dot cluster, so all, almost all of these were just things that were posted on Slashdot, hugely popular when that happens, and then relatively speaking, not, not much thereafter. Then the second cluster was front page news, so things like war in Iraq, I mean this was, yeah, ongoing, um, but anyway, people talk about it the day it happens, and not so much thereafter. Then there's another kind of news item, which is the editorial content, opinion pieces, where some people will read it on the first day, start discussing it, and then people pick up on it on the second or third day. And then there are other things like products, personality quizzes, things like that, that once they're out there, people keep on discussing them. Um, but as I said, we also wanted to know um, how to track exactly how the information is passing through the network. So for giant microbes, for example, we might find one blog that mentions it, but they actually got it from this other blog who got it from here, who got it from there, who got it from maybe a first blog to do that. So ideally, in order to do that, we just need the timings, uh, when, who mentioned giant microbes, and also the underlying network. So. You have your first blog to talk about something, blog two and blog three get the information from blog one, and everyone then gets it from blog two and blog three. However, the reality is not nearly as pretty because you don't know if that really is the first blog to mention it. There could be a blog that links to both blog two and blog one, and they both mention it, so do we know really where they saw it first? Then there could be another blog that doesn't link to anyone at all who's mentioned it before, which actually happens pretty often, so where did they read it? So what we do is some um, machine learning, a little bit of inference, to just try to find the most likely route that the information likely took through the network. So we take two blogs and we look at um, the textual similarity. Do they tend to talk about the same things? Do they tend to link to a lot of the same blogs? Um, do they tend to link to a lot of other things in common? And most importantly, have we observed a historic pattern? So has uh, B 
frequently mention something after A. So if this happens again, we can then infer, okay, A is most likely the source for this piece of information as well. And uh, Eitan Adar, with whom I was working with at HP Labs, made this very nice visualization, which on a timeline um, shows you which blogs mention what when. Um, so in the actual demo, if you mouse over, it tells you what the blog is. So this is Boing Boing. And then it might be kind of hard to see, but the links are also color-coded. So red are via links, so direct attribution. Blue is um, this blog links to Boing Boing, but didn't mention Boing Boing in this context. And we thought that that link was the most likely of the explicit links. And then green is just there's no links between the blogs, but based on how they've behaved in the past, we think that this is the likely route. And uh, what one can do with these inferred networks is to rank blogs according to um, how good they are as a source of new information. So you can get high what we call iRank, which is just running page rank on um, the inferred network. If you're boing boing, so you're so popular that naturally if you talk about something you're going to be the first you could be the first one and then you'll get a lot of other people to talk about it but if boing boing happens to uh, be getting a lot of its information from this other blog then this other blog would also get high i rank um, and finally one thing that i'm interested in looking at now is how um, information evolves as it goes through the network because this happens all the time and it actually happened to us when this was covered in Wired. So somewhere in the middle of the night, Wired posted this article with you know a slightly intriguing title, Warning Blogs Can Be Infectious. And all it did was explain what I just explained right now, that blogs tend to get information from other blogs and, and so on. Then it got slash dotted and um, it had a slightly more sinister um, title of Bloggers Plagiarism Scientifically Proven. Then by 10 o'clock that morning, Metafilter had the title, A Good Amount of Bloggers Are Outright Thieves. So Aton's looking at this and getting a little bit worried, so he writes a fact on the demo, which was linked to, just explaining what our research is doing because it's all getting quite distorted, but he also has a sense of humor about it, and so he titles it, do bloggers kill kittens? So, you know, every time you steal a URL or something, a poor innocent kitten dies. And sure enough, after lunch, several bloggers actually titled their posts, Bloggers Kill Kittens. So, um, and how am I on time? Okay, okay, perfect. Okay, so the last thing I'll talk about is our study of political blogs. And this was joint work with Natalie Glantz at IntelliSeq, and she's actually um, one of the main people behind Blog Pulse, which is a blog tracking software. Um, so first, blogs or political blogs are gaining in importance, and this was kind of the first election, the 2004 election, where they played a big role. So increasingly, people were going online to get political info, and even though not that many internet users actually read blogs, the ones who do read blogs tend to also read political blogs. And there are some, uh, uh, you know, presidential campaign first. So um, Howard Dean had used his blog very effectively for a grassroots effort where he raised, you know, millions of dollars or something through small contributions in great thanks to, in great part thanks to his blog. Um, there were also, oh yes, so the po uh, political bloggers were also credentialed as journalists and inv invited to the national conventions. And then there were these aggregators created to kind of um, provide a single source where you could learn about what these bloggers were observing. In order to do this study, we gathered as many political blogs as we could. So we went to different online directories and we would get the names of and URLs of conservative and liberal blogs. We didn't consider other categories such as moderate blogs or libertarian because they were far fewer in number and actually less well linked to. We then looked at all of the blogs that that set linked to and saw 
maybe a few dozen other blogs who, which were political, and we had to hand label those because in the directories we didn't find uh, an affiliation for them. In the end, we had a surprisingly balanced set, so 676 liberal and 659 conservative blogs. So just like the election was neck and neck, so were the political bloggers, at least in number. And then what we did was we just mapped out the network. We let um, we used just a, a regular layout algorithm and colored the blogs. So red is conservative and blue is liberal. What you can see right away is that um, there it's basically like a barbell where the conservatives are linking predominantly to other conservatives and liberals predominantly to other liberals, and less than 10% of the links are between them. We also found that conservative blogs were more likely to have at least one link to them and to link to at least once. And this was also reflected in the average number of links that they had. So for liberals, it was 13.6, and for conservatives, it was 15.1. But this was in large part just due to the fact that some liberal blogs had no links at all. If we look at the distribution of how many incoming links there are to a blog, and this is a cumulative distribution, so I'll just actually skip to the non-cumulative one, and also non-log-log -log scale, what you can see is, you know, 100 blogs on each side getting just one link. This doesn't include the ones that get no links at all. And, um, and then a few blogs, so this is Daily Coast, and I think this might be Instapundit, where actually from that pool of 1,400 blogs are um, getting, you know, a few hundred links. So there's definitely this concept of A-list blogs, the ones that everyone reads and pays attention to. And we wanted to study them in greater detail. But how do you decide exactly which the A-list blogs are? There are definitely different ranking approaches. So Technorati uses links both in the posts of blogs and in the blog roles to figure out which blogs are most popular. Site Meter actually gives the blogs uh, these little unique visit tracking meters and uh, then reports on, on the traffic. So based on the number of unique visits you get, this, that's your popularity score. Then the Truth Laid Bear um, combines the two in a secret formula so that it can't be manipulated. And the one that we ended up using in the end was just a blog post ranking, which only considers the links that you find within posts. And the reason why we did this is because blog roles can just become outdated. So we'd rather kind of get the blogs that are getting talked about actively in posts than ones that people just link to, to to have them on their list. So these were the top 20 liberal blogs. Um, you can see that they vary both in the number of citations they get from other blogs um, also in how many posts they have. And if we look at that large set of all the political blogs we gathered, you can see that they predominantly are linked to by other liberal blogs. Same thing for the conservative blogs. Um, one exception is Andrew Sullivan, who actually does get um, quite a few links from the left. And this is, he himself would admit that he is um, let's see, fiscally conservative but socially liberal. So he was kind of more in the middle. Um, and uh, so for these A-list blogs, we, we chose um, 20 from uh, each side. We just looked at the few months, so end of August to mid-November, and looked at all the citations that they made to one another. What we found was actually that the conservatives had cited each other more. So they had 16% fewer posts, but cited each other 40% more often. And as I'll show, this is in part due to this one story about the forged uh, memos that appeared on CBS about Bush's service in the National Guard that really kind of brought them together and had them talking to each other a lot. So 
what I'm showing here is the A-list blogs, conservative on the right, liberal on the left. You can see Andrew Sullivan kind of like creeping towards the left here. And what I'll do first is I'll remove the links where there weren't at least five citations in both directions. So um, you can see that be between the two spheres, there's very little communication left. And also, you can see the conservatives being a, a little bit better connected. Next, I'll remove the links that had fewer than 25 total citations, so added up in both directions. And you can see the two spheres completely separating and the conservatives, again, looking a bit more um, connected. So I had mentioned that there were a few things that kind of got bloggers excited and, and talking a lot. And in particular, some of these things were breaking news that the bloggers had figured out before the mainstream uh, news source. So one of them was the SwiftVets anti-carry video, also the CBS memos. This was a story broken by Powerline, a conservative blog, and then the other blogs rushed in to, to talk about it as well. And then there was the Salon article, um, was Bush wired? And, you know, I guess there was a blog on salon.com um, where President Bush during the debates had some little bulge here and there's, there's speculation about it. So at least for the forged documents um, discussion, you can see that the conservatives talk about it a whole lot. And because it's something that's kind of running in their favor, um, but for the liberals, there's, there's relatively less discussion of it. Um, we could also test whether the blogs tend to be more uniform within their groups. So both sides have kind of accused each other of being political echo chambers. So just kind of echoing what they say and what the parties say and not really having independent thought. But we didn't find this really to be the case. So both sides, if we looked at the pairwise similarity between the blogs, were kind of um, on the same level. And of course, they were much less similar between each other. So what a liberal blog talked about was not typically what a conservative blog talked about. And we can turn this analysis around and not just see which blogs are similar, but also see what phrases are similar. And here, I'll just try and show a demo. OK, so each point here is a phrase. So this is like security issues. So um, what's colored more towards the red end of the spectrum is what the conservatives were talking about a lot. And what is blue is what the liberals were talking about a lot. So you can see that the conservatives are interested in chemical weapons and things having to do with you know, explosives and terrorism, things like that. They're also critical of the mainstream media because they felt like, at least in some cases, they, they were able to get the story before the mainstream media did. And then the liberals were quite upset with Bush's tax cut and in general were kind of critical of his you know, tax increases, payroll, like economic policies. They, they didn't like that at all. And uh, I, I think this is also related to criticism of the tax policy. And then because we followed the blogs until shortly after the election, it was the liberals who were more concerned with voter fraud and those kinds of issues. So they, they kind of uh, were talking about the actual mechanics of the election a bit more. So. Um, one other interesting thing is which political figures the blogs talk about. So you might think that each side would talk about its own politicians and support them. But um, interestingly enough, um, it kind of ended up being the reverse. So 59% of the me mentions of John Kerry were brightly right-leaning leaning blogs, presumably to criticize him. And somewhat less distinctly, 53% of the mentions of George Bush were by left-leaning blogs. Also, if you look at Michael Moore, more conservatives are talking about it, and Karl Rove, more liberals are talking about it. Um, 
uh, unsurprisingly, there's bias in some of the media sources. So um, the the New York Times, you know, is is mostly balanced. Maybe looking a little bit more liberal as far as um, how often it's cited. Um, same thing with the Washington Post, and then things like the National Review, heavily conservative. Of Fox News, also conservative, but Salon.com, very liberal. So not much surprising there. Um, and then this is the same thing, but looking at the larger set of all the blogs and which news sources they link to, either on their sidebars or in, in their posts. Um, and again, you know, unsurprisingly, National Review, quite conservative, but I guess Air America Radio, liberal. So just to conclude, we saw these two political blogospheres being quite divided, um, relatively little conversation between them. And also we observed a slight tendency for the conservatives to link to each other more heavily. Um, and we saw you know, different news sources for different leanings, and that's reflected in the blogs. Also that it's kind of more or that it's easier to criticize the other side and, and talk about the other side than to support your own, um, your own people. And so when this study came out, we had a little flood of email, and some of the email was saying, look, you know, things are changing. There's this bankruptcy bill that's come up for a vote. I think first it was in the House and then the Senate. And all of these blogs from both sides of the spectrum are rallying together to defeat the bill. And this is what the conversation looked like. So each node here is a post. And so there can be multiple posts from the same blog, and they're linked to by a heavy line. And a light line is between uh, posts from different blogs. And you can actually see, yes, that there is interaction between the conservatives and liberals. And I've thrown in some news articles and government websites. Well, so this is all good, except that the bill still managed to pass. So it kind of puts into question, you know, so far how um, influential are the political blogs. Um, so that's it. Um, if you'd like to learn more, here's my research page, which is kind of under construction because of my move. And there's the School of Information at the University of Michigan. So any questions? Yes. Uh, no, no, we didn't. I mean, we were just observing kind of the... Oh, sorry. If we had uh, um, done any studies of information overload with uh, all the blogs that I guess these days you can read and, and so on. So, no, but I think there was an interesting study by... Actually, they're both bloggers, um, Dan D uh, Dresner and Henry Farrell. And uh, what they did was they interviewed journalists and asked, which political blogs do you read? And they just had to list 10. And the interesting thing was that a lot of these lists had a lot of overlap, which meant that they're all reading the A-list blogs. And I think the argument is kind of like, if there is something worthwhile, it will filter up to these top blogs. So you know, maybe that's part of the way that people are dealing with it. Oh, um, <laughs> so, I mean, for, okay, for the email logs, it wasn't so so bad. I mean, it's just um, Perl scripts to run through it. And the real pain is, you know, um, Microsoft Exchange logs look weird. And um, also, there are all these email aliases and so on. So I, I can't say it was... There wasn't a lot of pre-processing to be done. I mean, same thing if you're doing analysis of blogs. There's different URLs that map to the same thing. So you just kind of need to figure it out. And part of it is regular expression matching. And part of it is looking through and seeing what doesn't make sense. Or seeing if there's, um, you know, you might see a network and you see two, uh, two nodes that have many of the same links. Well, you should just double check that it's not actually the same blog. And, and that sort of thing. 
And Blog Pulse is actually a very powerful engine, and they've been running it for a couple of years now. Now they're tracking uh, millions of blogs, and they have all sorts of neat tools on top of uh, on top of that search engine that let you look at things like trends. So if you're interested in how much are people talking about Gmail versus Hotmail versus Yahoo? You can kind of see, you know, day by day what the discussion is and, and kind of do that kind of analysis. So when we're looking at political blogs, it was greatly facilitated by the fact that Blog Pulse already had a way of parsing out all the entries. And then there was, of course, like getting the link structure was an extra step, but, you know, totally doable in, in Perl. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the tough part is that when you're doing this kind of study, there's always, like, one blog that you're really interested in that isn't, doesn't happen to be in this readily available data set, and then you have to go back and, you know, make sure you get it. So, yeah.